welcome to the session guys uh, i'm karsun so we'll be covering the uh, security pillar of the uh, shovel architecture framework so let me just uh, quickly take you through the agenda uh, for this particular uh, session uh, so we'll be having a quick introduction into a uh, few basic concepts that uh, you need to be aware of most probably uh, most of you will already know this so we'll not be spending a lot of time on this and uh, after that we will be diving into uh, identity management uh, how we can do infrastructure protection and what sort of uh, services that is available in azure that allows you to do those things and encryption how azure does encryption when it comes to data and what are the services that is available and uh, we also look at the network security as well which is one of the important uh, aspects that we need to look into and finally we'll uh, take a look at the case study and the uh, reference architecture that we have which is a serverless web application architecture and where some of these uh, concepts that we talked about and some of the services that we have how those are applied uh, in this particular architecture and, and where you should uh, look into in terms of security so uh, to start off um, so we we also we, we in, in security we have this uh, concept of zero trust model so previously in in, in earlier organizations uh, like what they thought and what the thinking pattern was that everything that is inside of your organization uh, organization's network is considered uh, trustworthy and uh, once you are in the organization's network everything is good everything is controlled but uh, that was a thinking a uh, few years back right so but uh, with the use of uh, mobile technologies with the prominence when it comes to policies like uh, uh, bring your own devices and especially in scenarios where we have to work remotely and work from office during these times this thinking pattern this traditional thinking does not work anymore so you just can't really rely on uh, employee or a user or someone is, that is working that will always work inside of the organization's network and organize within the organization so they will be accessing the services the applications from outside so we need to really think about uh, who we are trusting and uh, we should never like uh, never trust those people and never sort of uh, have uh, uh, that sort of a traditional mindset when it comes to security nowadays so the zero trust model is based on that you should never assume trust instead of uh, instead of doing that you should continuously validate it to make sure okay this is the right level of permission right level of access that this user is uh, having to applications or resources or whatever so it's a really important uh, idea to have in mind and uh, after that uh, we have this uh, other idea about uh, uh, defense in depth so this is something uh, that is really important which is it's a multi-layered approach for security right so when you're securing your environments your applications uh, it's never about a single layer it's never about a single point right you need to you need to have a deep look at uh, all the layers of your application and apply security where necessary on each of these areas or each of these layers right so it's basically by doing this um, you you can never guarantee a single measure that you have in place will will basically uh, deter an attacker right so you have to have that mindset okay when one layer fails so one security measure fails you have another security measure down the line or down in the other layers that will prevent or slow down the advancement of the attacker so it's really important to have that uh, focus uh, on different layers so if you think about this defense in depth there are several layers that we need to think about so the data is at the very center of everything so it's it's basically what the attacker wants right so it's data then we have application on top of it we have compute network the parameter that is uh, basically the internet and the parameter that is separating your infrastructure your application from the internet and then we have identity and access and then finally physical security so we'll look at uh, briefly about each of these uh, particular areas or layers 
So data is basically what is really important to use, it's critical for your organization, and that is what attackers are after. So that is what they want to gain once you, and try to get access to your systems, right? And they, they go away with your data. And this is at the center of the uh, layers, and uh, it can be anything. It can be something that is stored in your databases. It could be something, a file that is in your like uh, disks or on our on-prem machine or or on a VM. So it could be anything, right? So you need to make sure that the this layer is never reached. Ideally, so your layers on top of data should prevent an attacker from getting to this. And even if an attacker gets to this, then this layer should also be protected with mechanisms like encryption, where even if the attacker gets hold of data, then that data is useless or it is really difficult to get access to. And uh, the next layer is the next layer on top of data is basically the application layer. So this is where you need to be really vigilant. This is where most of us are working at. And uh, you need to make sure that uh, you need to make sure that uh, you practice uh, proper secure development practices and you make sure that your applications are secure and does not have vulnerabilities that may come from anywhere. It could be something that you unintentionally added by maybe writing some bad code. It could be a, a third party library that you unintentionally or without doing the proper diligence use that will expose your application into a to an attacker. So it's it's uh, something that you really need to be mindful of. So when you design applications, it has security should be a design requirement. So it must be considered and we talk about we talk about uh, practices we talk about devops we talk about security being shifted to the right or to the left where it is much closer to your development cycles and you need to have these practices this uh, this automated analysis or whatever that you use to ensure security of your application integrated into your day to day application development life cycle so that way you ensure the application security uh, in this particular layer. And then you have the compute layer. This is basically where your applications are running on. And this could be something like an on-premise uh, virtual machine. It could be a cloud virtual machine. So any compute instance where your applications are running on falls under this. And uh, there are several ways you can ensure the security of this, this particular layer. You must ensure that only the like people who access, who, who really needs the access is given access. And you need to basically make sure that uh, proper access rights are given according to the whatever the activity that they need to do. And proper monitoring should be in place. You need to make sure the operating systems that up, are up to date, up to date and uh, you are basically patched for any latest security vulnerabilities that is out there. So depending on what type of uh, uh, services that you use, uh, if you are using, uh, let's say, if your applications are running on on-premise uh, servers, then you have a lot of responsibility to handle this. And depending on whether you are using infrastructure as a service or platform as a service, the level of uh, responsibility will shift, but that responsibility will be there, uh, be there depending on where you are. And uh, when it comes to network, uh, it's really important uh, to have proper segmentation of your network uh, and control access to these uh, the, these segments. And you need to make sure that you limit the communications uh, communications between resources to exactly what it needs. Right, so. If, if your database is communicating with a different service, then you should only open up ports that is absolutely needed for that communication. So you, we talk about this concept of deny by default. So everything is denied uh, by default. And uh, only that is uh, needed or, or necessary is allowed uh, by, by your networks. And uh, there are several services that we will look at that allows you to do this. And uh, when it comes to internet access, you should always keep an eye on what is coming into your network. You need to be able to restrict them and then basically limit the communication inbound and outbound uh, when needed. 
and and if you are connecting especially in a, in, a, in a scenario where you have hybrid workloads where you have some of your infrastructure and applications running on the cloud and you have some of it running on on premise then you need to have secure methods of communicating from your on premise uh, networks to the cloud networks so we uh, we have several services that allows you to do that as well we'll look at it and uh, perimeter is basically protecting from network based attacks so this is where where the majority of your attacks uh, will be focusing on getting through this layer uh, especially if you are if you if you have internet facing applications then this is a big uh, uh, layer that you need to focus on and uh, um, attacks like uh, DDoS uh, attacks and uh, those sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, attack vectors are frequently being used to either take down your infrastructure entirely or at least uh, make your services that you offer to your customers unavailable or inaccessible. So using systems or services like DDoS creation is really important and. Uh, having your firewalls properly configured it's important just it's, it's not about just having it it's having the proper configuration and proper control of it and at this layer constant monitoring is absolutely needed so you need to have uh, everything configured properly and everything monitored properly so you can actually react to any any um, attacks that is coming your way and uh, take action when needed and identity and access is the next layer on top. Uh, it's all about basically ensuring the identity of the users uh, and uh, basically securing the access of, for that users, right? And uh, like we talked about previously as well, it doesn't matter whether it's a user or it's a service that is communicating with other service, allowing only the access that this user or services or whatever that is needed is important. So when it comes to uh, this layer, we are mainly talking about uh, basically users and you need to have uh, ways of managing these identities and using practices like single sign on and using multi-factor authentication to add an additional layer to the authentication process is really important. And uh, it's not only having proper mechanisms of authenticating, it's all about uh, having proof of people doing what they are supposed to do as well. So auditing and logging is really important because that's how you trace back. That's how you find what okay what this particular user has done at this particular time. And if someone has done something intentionally or unintentionally, the audit log is the main source where you can actually go through and find out uh, what exactly has happened. So even when it comes to uh, external audits, it, like different uh, certifications that you need to have, auditing is one of the main uh, main areas that you need to focus on, and this layer is, is, is no exception on that. And finally, you have the layer outside, or the outermost layer, which is physical security, where it's basically securing or safeguarding the physical infrastructure that you have. So this, this again applies uh, in different ways. So for example, if you are an organization that is running uh, on-premise, uh, fully on-premise, then something that you really need to worry about. And even if you are running hybrid workloads where you have some part of your applications on-premise, still that is something that you need to really worry about, right? But when it, when it comes to cloud uh, solutions where you are fully on the cloud, Physical security is something that you don't really need to worry about. Uh, that is basically covered by your cloud uh, cloud solutions or cloud uh, service provider. But depending on the workloads that you have, uh, it's it's you you have to you have to think about it. So it's uh, it's the outermost layer that is uh, in this concept uh, defense in depth. And we also talk about this shared security responsibility model. This shared responsibility model. Uh, it's, it's a family thing, so uh, it, regardless of uh, whether you are using a cloud provider to host your host your solutions, or whether you are using SaaS, FaaS, or infrastructure services, or whatever, the 
see a uh, responsibility when it comes to security is a shared uh, responsibility so no single party is responsible for uh, uh, for security entirely it's up to you and if you especially look at uh, in this uh, diagram when it comes to even comes when it comes to platform as a service uh, uh, things like network controls applications identity and directory infrastructure you can clearly see that responsibility is shared between the uh, the let's say the cloud provider as well as the customer customer being us the developers who are managing the infrastructure because these uh, these areas you sometimes uh, most of the work is done by the uh, cloud provider or uh, in this case uh, we talk about uh, azure it's microsoft but you have some control over how things are configured as well so having the proper configuration having uh, proper levels of access users not having too much access is something that you are responsible of so ha that is something that you really need to understand when it comes to this uh, shared security responsibility model it's not a single party that is responsible for everything and uh, next we'll talk about the sort of main concepts when it comes to uh, the uh, security uh, in a, in a, in a well architected solution so identity management is one of the important ones so identity basically acts as another layer of security right so digital identity identities is what we are using these days it's really important part of uh, any system today and uh, like we said uh, earlier and at the beginning uh, the previously identity and uh, how we control access is basically within the organization users are expe expected to come come to work to the organization and they maybe log on to uh, log into your desktops and they use their organization credentials and then they're good right but they are not able to access the organization's network from outside so now things have changed with mobile uh, devices uh, laptops uh, we are able to bring in our own devices and we are connecting remotely to perform our daily work uh, so it's completely changed and organizations now need to look at the different capabilities not only to kind of continue their businesses but allow their customers and the employees to perform their work regardless of where they are so features like uh, single sign on uh, it's really important and it having the ability to easily upgrade the, your legacy applications to use modern authentication mechanisms like uh, open id connect it's really important and you should be able to uh, enable things like multi factor authentication for logins outside of your organization and even have more finer level of control uh, on how users are logged in we will look at uh, how these things are managed and 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 most importantly allow the users to manage their own accounts because uh, because it's really important for example if your id organization has to manage every aspect of your users open users uh, identity and their accounts it will become a really tedious uh, it's, it, it's it's tedious it's 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 a lot of things to manage and in in a scenario where uh, an attacker or set of attackers are targeting let's say users accounts then it will be a nightmare to handle that so you have to have the capability for users to manage their own account data and also have the users use secure mechanisms to log in authenticate your organization to do their daily work and uh, single sign on like i said uh, more identities the user has to manage higher the risk so for example if you are using 10 different accounts uh, to use uh, 10 different services then that would lead to 10 different user logins 10 different passwords and what users tend to do is they they tend to reuse passwords right and uh, they are they have many passwords to remember easier thing is to reuse and if someone is vigilant to actually use 10 different passwords then there's a chance that they might forget the password then what they would do is uh, it could be an automatic uh, uh, password uh, reset or maybe the organization is actually responsible of 
auditing that request and making sure that uh, the password is reset uh, or is the request is approved. In that case, then the organization has another responsibility to manage it. So it's it's a really bad situation to be in and single sign-on is something that solves this problem really easily. And uh, like I said, at the organizational level, managing user support requests is going to be held in this scenario. So with single sign-on, what you do is it's really simple. You basically remember a single strong password and you use that same identity across different it could be different applications it could be different organizations for example uh, even in our case uh, we use our nitranex uh, azure ad uh, identity to look log into our customers uh, ad so that identity can be shared everywhere and it's a really secure manner and you can just control everything for that uh, single identity and uh, multi-factor authentication comes naturally when it comes to single sign-on because you are using a single identity usually it's a really best good practice to actually enable multi-factor authentication so you provide uh, basically another factor or another another thing in the identity authentication process to make sure your identity is verified right and it provides additional security for your identities as well as uh, uh, any organization or any application that you are accessing. So this basically requires two or more factors or elements in the full authentication process to continue. And it could be something, you know, basically a password or security question or whatever. And something you have. So if you are, most of you are familiar with using mobile authenticator apps, Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator. So this authenticator app will generate a code and that is something that you have. And something you are is basically biometrics. It's, it's something like a fingerprint that you use to uh, authenticate. Uh, it could be a f uh, facial scan, it could be a retina scan. So it could be anything. So it, it, it's a combination of all of these or some of these in the full authentication process to make sure you, the user is authenticated and this basically limits the uh, limits the possibility that an attacker could have access to all of these factors so if you are using your thumb as a uh, as a authentication mechanism then the attacker needs to have your thumb as well or your at least your thumbprint so it's, it's 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 really important to have that sort of additional layer when it comes to authenticating and this is something that is uh, really important, uh, conditional access policies and conditional access. So multi-factor authentication is another layer, uh, an additional security requirement. And conditional access policies brings in a lot of uh, other things into the picture as well. So you can have finer grain uh, detailed control when it comes to access uh, it could be for different services it could be for different uh, applications or whatever and uh, for examples you can take uh, let's say you you group uh, you have different Azure AD groups or whatever and depending on which group you have you have a particular set of permissions and uh, based on that uh, if a user is in let's say group A he, uh, he is able to access the service. If it is not, then you are not able to access. And uh, location, basically IP-based, uh, it's, it's another thing. For example, different organizations and applications might have requirements when it comes to geolocation. So you are not allowed to access the resources or applications if you are, let's say, in China. Not a very good reputation that these guys have, right? So, in Ch other than China, everyone, every, everywhere else is okay, right? So that kind of rule there could be. And the, one of the important factors is this uh, sign-in risk factor. So it's something that is calculated uh, based on the risk factor. You may be allow, you may be required to use multi-factor authentication. So this risk factor is something interesting. It could be. Uh, it, it, the risk factor is calculated in different ways. It could be in a scenario where you have uh, anonymous access. Could be you are using a, a, a VPN or you are using a Tor network, uh, Onion network uh, to sort of access services. Then that's an anonymous IP address, so that's a flag. And uh, it could be like uh, blacklisted IP addresses, so your IP address is associated with a with a malicious service or, or something, 
and uh, it, it even could be based on your logins or login history as well for example if you are five minutes ago you are logged in in sri lanka and let's say after 20 minutes you are logged in you uh, from united states so that is a suspicious behavior so all of these factors are taken into consideration when these systems calculate the risk factor and depending on that risk factor you can force multi-factor authentication or even block the access altogether so having this conditional access policies and conditional access is really important these days especially in a global scale and uh, infrastructure protection is another topic that we need to talk about so cloud infrastructure is is, is actually a really important part of the business these days and um, it's absolutely essential that you control access to the infrastructure and people this is a tricky tricky situation to be in because people need access to perform their work but they don't need too much access and that would lead to catastrophic incidents and uh, and managing this is really an important aspect and it makes sure you have to make sure that people get only the permissions that they need to perform the action and nothing more nothing less so failing to do this is basically catastrophic for a, uh, in, in a business perspective it could lose uh, basically lead to data loss it could be service unavailability uh, i we have all have experiences uh, in this uh, in these scenarios uh, uh, in our daily work hopefully you guys don't have uh, face that and hopefully you should never face that uh, in a perfect scenario and uh, one of uh, one way of enabling this is basically role based access control so in natural we have this rbac uh, basically a way of assigning permissions and and uh, a role is basically a collection of uh, permissions that uh, can be directly assigned to a user or group so using these permissions and using these groups you can really like in detail control access to certain services or applications uh, in azure and this role based access control is basically uh, azure ad based you have full control over exactly how and what the user can access so it's a really important service that is uh, that is at the heart of azure and all the services that are that are that that is in in, in available in azure and uh, roles and management groups is another concept uh, so we we talked about roles are basically a set of permissions and uh, these roles can be assigned at different levels so uh, could be that uh, you are assigned a role at an individual resource instance for example you are given access to uh you are given contribute access to an app to azure app service instance so then at that point you only have access to that and if a particular if you want to get access to a full resource group then that's another layer and it could even be at a subscription level and uh, but uh, now azure has another layer called management groups so these management groups are basically spanning uh, different subscriptions so uh you can assign roles give permissions at the management group layer where that permission will propagate into multiple subscriptions and it is basically an like an hierarchy so depending on where you are assigning x access uh, it flows down into uh, the subscriptions that is uh, attached to that management group so if you can see this uh, this particular diagram so for the topmost management group it has two uh, subscriptions and another management group it doesn't have uh, uh, delete access so these two are limited there but in the other management group or this management group the delete access is given that means these two subscriptions have that access so likewise you can basically find manage and find uh, like manage access and permissions in very great detail when it comes to uh, Azure and using these roles and groups and management groups. And one of the most important uh, uh, aspects when it comes to infrastructure protection is privileged identity management, uh, which is a, a very comprehensive approach, a very continuous approach of uh, infrastructure protection. 
So this is a service uh, capability that provides uh, oversight into role assignments uh, and uh, auditing and real time activations and basically self service activations are also possible this is something that is really important because uh, in a in a scenario where uh, let's say uh, your operations team is working on a different time zone right so let's say we usually in adra what we have is our customers who are basically um, norwegian and they they are they are, they are the uh, the operations team they are in a different time zone and we are in a different time zone there are hours uh, of difference there like like many hours of difference right so if you need access to a production environment or a certain environment we have to wait uh, for them to give us access right so in that scenario if a production issue we need to that really like we need to really look into then hours are wasted just to kind of get access right so something like having just in time access where we request and certain set of trusted people will automatically get that access as soon as they request it so that is a capability in that scenario is really valuable to react to those scenarios right so this village identity management is coming as part of azure ad azure ad premium service so it allows you to sort of have just in time access and have trusted lists where as soon as they sort of request access it is given and you can time box it to let's say 12 hours 24 hours and you can also have the capability to, to for example i request, request access for a production environment and it has to be approved by someone in operation so someone higher up so that sort of approval process you can enforce uh, multi factor authentication for different activations for example we can say okay if you are accessing production infrastructure then you have to have multi factor authentication if you are accessing dev resources then okay just your password would be enough and likewise you can have fine grain control and the most important part is this is audited so the, everything is logged everything is tracked and uh, this is one of the like uh, even 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 in scenarios where organizations are under strict audit uh, compliance uh, requirements what they really look for is not uh, what uh, access or what level of uh, capabilities that users have it's what they're looking for is are you tracking it are you able to prove that this particular user did this or who had access to what at what time so that are the most important requirements and these uh, particular services are coming with it those are built in you have this capabilities and uh, also you need to provide identities to your azure services as well so it's really important it's not just users that are communicating with azure resources other different azure resources are communicating with each other as well so using connection strings uh, credentials in configuration files or, or or application code even it's such a bad practice right so you need to have a uh, ways of uh, allowing these services to communicate with each other and azure ad provides uh, two different mechanisms to, that allows you to do this so one 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 of these is basically a service principle and the other one which is uh, something that is came out recently uh, not that recent but uh, it's it's new uh, it's managed identities so looking at uh, service principles you need to have the idea of what an identity is right identity is basically something that can be authenticated so it can be a user name or password it can be a certificate it can be a secret key or whatever using that particular mechanism a particular identity is authenticated and that is called an identity and a principle is basically identity a particular identity acting with certain set of roles or permissions right and when you put these two together uh, you are basically uh, defining a service principle so service principle is an identity that is used by an azure application or azure service right so oh, it can be a service it can be an application and this particular service principle is assigned with some roles to perform different actions actions it could be to let's say uh, read some secrets from um, from let's say azure key vault or it could be external services that wants to get access to azure uh, to deploy an application for example if uh, uh, 
uh, let's say if you are using something like Azure DevOps, if you are using other type of uh, CI/CD uh, um, uh, environment, that environment needs to get access to Azure in order to deploy uh, your applications, right? So that is done through a service principle. So that is uh, one of the important concepts to identify and know about. And the other one is a managed identity. So in the, in the previous service principle, uh, you always have to have uh, something like uh, a secret or, or username password or certificate to in order to to, to authenticate so it could be even something like a connection string but uh, that is another complexity that you take into your responsibility because you have to manage that uh, secrets as well you have to manage that case you have to make sure that they are secure and they don't fall into the wrong hands but uh, managed identity is right, the capability to have an automatically managed identity. That means Azure or Azure AD takes care of creating the identity and managing the life cycle of the identity and also managing the credentials that is used to authenticate as well. So everything is taken out of our hands and securely done by Microsoft. There are different flavors, of course. Uh, 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 for example, they have these system assigned identities, they have user assigned identities, and depending on what type of identity you use, the life cycle is managed automatically or life cycle needs to be managed by you. But the use of credentials is fully managed by uh, Azure AD, so you don't have to have that responsibility. And that's, that is another point where things can go wrong, and that point is removed from uh, your hands. So it's really important, and uh, most of the services that are or rather yeah most of the services that are able to authenticate with Azure AD supports the use of managed identities as well uh, and uh, most of the services uh, platform services that you're using like uh, web applications kubernetes and uh, and batch services they support the use of managed identities so it's a really good practice if you are working with these resources or services uh, to use uh, and just avoid using connection strings and services or secrets so we need to talk about encryption as well, how encryption is held uh, in Azure. So like I said, data is at the middle of all that, all those uh, layers that we talked about. It's the most valuable asset in an organization. If data is compromised, then uh, basically it's game over for the organization, depending on how sensitive and how business critical the data is. and and Encryption is the last resort and it's the strongest line of defense that we have uh, in, 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 this, in this scenario to secure the data. So I'm not diving into detail on how encryption work and what, 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 how we can do it, but encryption is approached in two different ways when it comes to, uh, when it comes to Azure. Uh, one thing is encryption at rest and the other one is encryption in transit. So encryption at rest is basically you need to define what data at rest is. Any type of data that is stored in a physical medium is called data at rest. So it's 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 set. Uh, it could be something that you store in a Azure database. So it could be something that you store in a disk in a server, uh, or something or set of images or documents or whatever that you store in Azure storage account. So those are data at uh, rest. So Encryption at rest basically ensures that the data is not uh, readable or it's not usable without the secret or key that was used to de uh, encrypt it. You need to have it for decryption. And uh, like I said, even if an attacker gets through all of these uh, layers, when we talked about this defense in depth, finally he gets access to the data. But by using encryption, you can make sure that that data is unusable or at least extremely difficult to get to. So that is uh, one of the best uh, ways of uh, securing your data using uh, encryption. So encryption at rest is really important. And encryption in transit is basically making sure your data is secure when you are transferring the data from one place to another. So data moving from one location to another location is called data in transit. So this transition or this transmission can happen through the open internet. It could be through a private network. It could be through 
uh, whatever but you need to make sure that this uh, this this transmission is secure so the main two ways of you can do this is either you encrypt the data before you make the transmission or you make the transmission channel or transmission medium secure and uh, Basically, you set up a secure channel between the two locations and then you transmit the unencrypted data. So these are the two ways of handling this. And uh, before you sort of uh, 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 think about encryption and think about what are the services that are available for encryption, you need to understand what data should be encrypted and how you should classify the data. So it's really important because depending on on what you need to uh, encrypt or what you need to secure, the complexity of your solutions uh, are also like also depends on it, and the cost is also there because uh, the more processing or more encryption or whatever that you do, that is not free. That is that costs. So identifying and classifying what you need to encrypt is really important. And most of the time, these are categorized into three different uh, sections or, or categories, basically. Um, you have restricted, which is, the, which is the highest, or rather, it has the highest impact and the most significant risk if that uh, data is exposed or deleted or uh, compromised in a way. So this basically, this restricted uh, requires the highest level of protection. And uh, you also have public that uh, basically contains no risk. So anything that the public, general public uh, can know for, uh, is, is basically fall under this. And knowing that or deleting it or modifying it does not pose any business threat. And this doesn't require any level of protection. So the private is basically anything that does not fall under restricted or public falls under private. So this poses a like somewhat moderate risk if exposed and uh, some level of uh, protection is needed. So you don't have to spend, uh, let's say, that much money that uh, almost the same amount of money that you uh, spend on, let's say, protecting your restricted data. Uh, uh, to protect your private data. So you need to make sure that you classify those things or the where the data falls and then uh, make sure that information is known and based on that uh, you decide what sort of a solution that you uh, that you would want to use in your uh, architecture. And uh, encryption on Azure there are several ways that is that this is happening. So I'll start with Azure Key Vault, which is the core service when it comes to uh, security and encryption or securely storing uh, secrets and keys. This particular service is uh, is, is mostly like it, it can uh, integrate with other Azure services. It's more and more used with uh, securing other uh, Azure services. And it provides a uh, provides enterprise level protection it uses hardware security models modules uh, to make sure your secrets are properly secured and it can act as a centralized uh, store for your application secrets as well so there are built in uh, rather very easily integ uh, integratable sdks you can easily integrate with different services like uh, for example if you are using uh, Let's say, uh, for example, you can easily use this with something like a configuration. You can easily use this some with something like uh, Azure storage accounts to store your keys, which we will talk about soon. If you are using um, uh, app service certificates, the certificates for this uh, SSL communication is stored in Azure Key Vault. So this is a central service that sort of works with uh, all the other Azure services to provide uh, secure access to secrets and keys. And uh, Azure Storage Service Encryption is, is something that's really important. It's there out of the box. It automatically encrypts uh, your data when storing, so uh, encryption at rest is provided. It uses 256-bit uh, uh, AES encryption. And uh, decryption happens automatically, so you don't need to do any code changes or fancy things to get things up and running. So uh, it does it for you and Microsoft manages these keys uh, 
that are used in uh, service storage service encryption but you have the ability to use your own keys you can uh, use azure key vault in conjunction with uh, using your own keys on this and services like azure managed disk uh, blob services files queues uh, table storage are covered with the azure storage uh, service encryption and uh, description encryption is another thing and uh, this is basically for your virtual machine disks and it has the ability to use for windows it uses bitlocker and for linux it uses dencrypt uh, for volume encryption and it can do it for your both uh, data disk and os disk as well and again if you want to manage your own keys when it comes to this encryption you can easily integrate as your key vault for this as well and uh, transparent data encryption is available for your azure sql services and data warehouses and it performs real time encryption and decryption for your databases so it not only databases it covers your backups your transaction logs and everything and uh, the important thing is uh, you don't need to do any application level changes uh, to leverage this and uh, azure take care of managing likewise uh, in the previous as well but again if you want to take that uh, control to your hands you can use azure key vaults and your own keys to do this and uh, if you're using new instances that was created recently after this service is introduced then everything is enabled by default uh, it's uh, transparent data encryption is enabled but if you have old instances then you can easily go in and enable it and the other aspect is network security which is uh, which is again one of the really important areas and uh, it's basically uh, you have to protect the resources uh, yeah like within the organization as well as from outside of your organization right so limiting exposure make sure that your resources are kept safe and secure and there are like uh, three areas that you need to really focus on when it comes to traffic flow so there are traffic flow happening between new applications and the internet uh, communication is happening there there are traffic flowing from your applications to another application other applications so amongst applications and uh, the users you are using the application there is traffic flow there as well so you need to think about all three of these areas when it comes to network security and how you are going to manage it and uh, when it comes to traffic flow between applications and the internet this is the most likely place where an attack could happen and attackers are most likely to target these areas of the network and uh, you need to make sure the access is limited and you need to make sure that Uh, everything is monitored properly as well because uh, having monitoring and having auditing is really important for you to identify an attack early and uh, be be ready for it as as well as uh, to do to do uh, proactive measures rather than reactive measures when it comes to uh, outside attacks and uh, traffic flow amongst applications uh, this is usually the case i mean applications work with other applications for their like operations and uh, data usually flows through applications and different environments and uh, you need to make sure this data flow is controlled in a way that uh, if for some reason a particular resource is compromised then that does not compromise the other resources that are in the network or that are communicating with this particular compromised uh, service or application so it, you need to have that control there and uh, and this makes sure that uh, if a particular application or service or resource uh, gets compromised that won't affect the other applications and it won't propagate through the network so it's really important that you manage this as well and finally the traffic flow between uh, users and applications again uh, users interact with the application it could be inside of your network it could be outside of your network but uh, you need to make sure that you give proper access uh, and proper authentication mechanisms and make sure everything is in place to limit the exposure to your resources and your applications outside uh, for outside attacks and you need to make sure that the uh, 
uh, secure mechanisms that we talked about previously, like uh, using single sign-on, uh, multi-factor authentication, conditional access. Those techniques are used to make sure the users uh, utilize the resources and applications securely. And uh, we talked about uh, the layered approach. We talked about the defense in depth, right? So that's the layered approach when it comes to security. And same goes for Azure Network Security as well. So it's similar to other aspects, you need to take a layered approach towards network security. So it's not just enough to focus on a single layer. It's not just enough to focus on your perimeter security. It's not enough to just to focus on security when it comes to communication between services within your network. So you make you make sure that all the layers are covered. And uh, when an attacker gets through one layer, there are additional countermeasures and it's real difficult to get access to the subsequent layers. And uh, internet protection is basically uh, the perimeter of your network or network perimeter that is the internet and outside of that perimeter it's internet and uh, you need to focus on limiting and eliminating attacks coming from the internet so that is where the most uh, amount of attacks will be originating and uh, like we discussed uh, making sure only the necessary inbound and outbound communication is happening ensures this uh, ensures this internet protection and there are several services uh, in Azure that allows you to enable this as well as monitor this uh, pretty easily and one of these is basically Azure security center which is something that uh, uh, that is it's it's not just limited to a certain set of uh, Azure resources. It spans through the entire subscription. It looks at everything, and it is some a tool that you can use to identify the resources that are affected by this. What are the internet-facing resources? What are the uh, threats that has detected uh, or what are the ex existing issues for example if you if you don't have, if you have uh, uh, virtual networks that doesn't have any nsgs attached to it then that's a, that that's an issue that security center will point you into uh, into that direction and it will also provide you recommendations on what exactly you need to do to prevent these uh, issues as well as alert you when it comes to uh, active uh, attacks or any 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 vulnerabilities that you you will have so it's a really important service that you can use to make sure that uh, you have that information that you need to making sure your uh, network is protected and an application gateway national application gateway is another service that you can use so it's for your http based services you can use this and uh, it includes a web application firewall that uses uh, OWASP 3.4 uh, rule sets that provides protection from known vulnerabilities. So all the traffic that flows, flows between this application gateway is monitored and uh, analyzed using these core rule sets. And only the valid requests are passed through to access the underlying layers. So it's something that you can easily configure for your uh, uh, infrastructure if you have uh, uh, yeah, if you have, if you have uh, multiple sites that you need to access uh, uh, failover scenarios. You can easily put this uh, application gateway in front of it and get the load balancing capabilities as well as the firewall uh, capabilities that is attached to it. And uh, network virtual appliances is another one. Uh, it's for it's mostly used for not an HTTP based services uh, for your background services or your batch services that is running. This is something that you can, for example, if you need uh, if you need full control over what you need to monitor, what you need to block, and what you need to control, then going for a network virtual appliance is the best idea. But the caveat is that you need to you need to have the expertise to how to configure this as well because for example if you take uh, the application gateway that we talked about previously you set it up and and most of the like grunt work is done for you and 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 it is backed by the uh, security infrastructure that Azure has in place as well 
But if you are using something like a network virtual appliances from uh, vendors like Cisco, Citrix, uh, NetGate, Trend Micro, they provide the service. It's up to you to sort of configure it properly. And it's really important that you have the expertise to do it because improper configuration will basically mean that you are letting certain attacks or certain vulnerabilities through. So it increases complexity as well as it increases uh, control as well. So depending on what you need exactly, uh, the, what, what's the requirement, uh, depending on that, you can actually use these services. And Azure DDoS protection is another service. Uh, this one is, uh, so any internet facing service is at risk of a DDoS attack. And that will likely to take your applications offline. It will make your services unavailable for your users or even take down your services entirely. But uh, Azure DDoS prevention is provided by default for all services by default. So it's a basic level of protection that Azure provides you. But you can pay more to get enhanced protection and more capabilities by using a standard uh, DDoS protection uh, plan. And you can attach it to services like VNets uh, and make sure that capabilities are enabled. And virtual network security is very important. Uh, virtual networks are the fundamental building blocks when it comes to private networks. And uh, VNets also allow different types of uh, Azure resources or services to communicate with each other. And uh, it's, it's basically best practice to limit communication between services. And uh, this has to happen. So even though you are in a virtual network, it's not the best idea to have everything like just lying there. You have to segment it. You have to have proper rules. Uh, you have you can use easily use uh, services like network security groups to sort of control uh, traffic flow. So we'll look at look at it uh, in the pre next slide. So NSCs or network security groups are the critical Azure service that allows you to have this control and uh, basically works uh, on allow deny communication rules that you in you put in place for example if you if you have uh, like this uh, if you have this diagram it has the back end it has a mid end and the front end so for example the front end doesn't need to communicate with the back end services so that communication can be blocked by uh, an nsg by applying rules for it and uh, it only needs to communicate with the internet and the uh, mid tier so those sort of fine level, fine grain control you can put uh, forth using NSGs. And uh, if you want uh, other Azure services uh, to communicate with uh, virtual networks, you can use uh, these service endpoints. Virtual network service endpoints are supported uh, in some Azure services, which allows you to sort of communicate with uh, virtual networks and resources that are inside of your virtual networks. And uh, network integration is basically um, you have to connect your on-premise infrastructure with your cloud infrastructure as well. So there could be hybrid workloads. So you just need to connect these uh, networks together for administrative capabilities as well. So there are several ways of doing this. Uh, one way is using virtual private networks. So Azure provides uh, uh, VPN gateways that you can use to connect your uh, on-premise network uh, with your Azure virtual networks and uh, that uh, communication can happen securely with uh, these VPN gateways. And if you want more bandwidth, if you want more security, you can have a dedicated uh, connection to your Azure resources as well using, uh, using the Azure Express route, which is basically a dedicated connection that is installed by uh, using certified uh, connectivity providers. So it basically bypasses the public internet and you have your own connection to your Azure resources. So it's it's quite expensive, but uh, if security or rather that expense is justified by the capabilities that it provides. And virtual network peering is another service that you can use. Basically, virtual networks are isolated. Uh, they do not communicate with each other. But if you want uh, virtual networks to be communicating with each other, you can use uh, virtual network peering. 
and you can also use NSGs uh, like we discussed to control the traffic flow and making sure only the necessary uh, uh, communication is happening between services uh, in Azure. So uh, that leads us to the case study. So we have this um, uh, uh, success learning institute uh, as a case study. I think previous uh, speakers must have talked about this as well in respect with uh, their uh, tier. So we have this uh, serverless uh, uh, web application architecture that this particular case study uses where you use uh, Azure AD for your sign-ins and authentication. You use uh, functions backend with Cosmos DB and API management layer in front of it with uh, uh, your static content or static uh, resources are basically hosted through a CDN backed by a storage blob. Um, so I'll take you guys through briefly uh, with considerations when it comes to authentication, encryption, and likewise. So when it comes to authentication, since we are using uh, Azure AD, it's really easy for us to set up uh, SSO uh, using Azure AD authentication. And also, if you need more final grain control on where users are logged in, you can use conditional access, so you can enforce MFA. So those are certain considerations that you can take. And when it comes to communicating with the backend, the uh, API management layer will basically handle the token validation with Azure AD. So once the user logs into the uh, front end application, the token is sent uh, when they want to call the APIs. Uh, that is uh, basically the HTTP triggers functions. And the API management layer sits in between of these and they can do policy validations uh, to validate the uh, the uh, token that is sent and then between the function and the API management the function key can be used uh, to authenticate uh, or, 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 yeah, to authenticate with the function so we basically allow we, we, we are not allowing the user to bypass the uh, API gateway or API management uh, so that is something that you can set up for uh, set up very easily for this particular scenario and when it comes to encryption you can enforce uh, https at different levels so since you are using uh, cdn cdn supports custom domains with https uh, that should be or that must be enabled and uh, you can require secure trans uh, transfer for storage accounts uh, and you can also set up uh, api management with uh, https only and for even for Azure Functions, you can enable HTTPS only uh, since it's basically based on the app service or the app service uh, architecture. And uh, when it comes to storage, uh, Azure storage, uh, it is uh, it is uh, encrypted by default using storage service encryption. But if you want uh, more control or if you want the control of managing the keys as well, you can use your own keys with Azure Key Vaults instead of using the Microsoft Managed Keys. And uh, for perimeter security, uh, basically we talked about this earlier as well. We can require the function key for calling the Azure function. So it basically avoids bypassing the API management layer. So API management layer is basically responsible for providing the function key and calling the Azure function endpoints. Uh, after authenticating the users, uh, authenticating the users using the token that is provided, and if you need higher security, uh, very tighter security, you can basically move the Azure function into a virtual network. So this is done through changing the hosting model to a con from a consumption model to uh, 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 to a more dedicated uh, hosting plan. So this is available through uh, app service environments. So this allows you to sort of uh, connect. Uh, a virtual network or put this in, inside a virtual network and use uh, uh, service endpoints to sort of communicate with the virtual network. And you can also attach uh, standard Azure DD, uh, DDoS protection and attach that to the virtual network uh, to make sure you have DDoS protection against uh, your HTTP endpoints, uh, which is powered by Azure Functions. And also, Azure, or rather the API management layer, also uses a static IP. So basically, since you are inside of a virtual network, you now have the capability to limit access to every other IP other than the 
API management static IP. So this can be done easily through uh, the virtual network using NSGs. So, and uh, application secrets like we talked about earlier, it's really important uh, to avoid uh, using connection strings uh, secrets in the code base. At a minimum, you should be storing them inside of uh, app settings in, in, in Azure App Service or functions because that is encrypted when they are stored. So that has that is automatically handled for you. But uh, Azure Key Vault is uh, a very good service that you can use to securely store the connection strings and secrets or whatever that is being used uh, by the applications. But when it comes, especially when it comes to this particular architecture, you need to be mindful that uh, connection information that is required to, to trigger the function or any connection information that is required uh, to get uh, sort of an input binding or related to bindings that needs to be added to the app settings instead of uh, key vault. So if not, you might run into weird scenarios where as soon as you deploy the application, the application will work or the function will work. But as soon as it goes into a uh, sleep state uh, for a cold start scenario, the application won't work from that point onwards. So those information must be there in the app settings, but there it also is encrypted when stored. So it's securely uh, stored. So those are some of the uh, considerations that uh, we can take when it comes to this particular reference architecture that we talked about. So that sort of concludes the session. Thank you.